I want to say welcome to our church family. We're glad that you've come to worship with us this morning. And uh, for those of you tuning in online, we want to say welcome to you. We love you. We're glad that you're with us wherever you may be. Hey, I have a joke for us this morning before we jump in God's word. Is everybody ready? Okay, because I I need to know if you're ready, because last time I told a joke and it was very funny, but nobody laughed. So um, y'all ready? Okay, here we go. (laughs) <laughs> Thank you. Yes. <laughs> a kindergarten teacher gave her class a show and tell assignment. Each student was instructed to bring in an object to share with the class that represented their religion and faith. The first student got up in front of the class and said, my name is Benjamin and I am Jewish and this is a star of David. The second student got up in front of the class and said, my name is Mary. I am Catholic and this is my rosary. The third student got up in front of the class and said, my name is Tommy. I am a Baptist and this is a casserole. <laughs> It's pretty cute, right? It's pretty cute. If you've never been to a church potluck, I'm so sorry. And at the same time, I'm not sorry at all. So, um, hey, we have been in a series called Mythbusters. Everybody turn to your neighbor and say, Mythbusters. <clears throat> And we've been looking at various myths about God and the scriptures and about human life. And we've been debunking, we've been busting these myths by looking at the truth of God's word and the truth of who God is and wrapping our minds and our hearts around this truth that sets us free. Amen. And we've been looking at different myths because we recognize myths, these common misheld conceptions about whatever it may be, they have a massive impact on our lives, right? What we believe has a massive impact on how we live. And we have been anchoring in this thought that what we believe about God has the most massive impact on how we live, right? A.W. Tozer said it this way, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. As we've been in this series, we've looked at various myths concerning is God in control or is God in charge? Does God give sickness to certain people or does God want every single person to be healed? Does our sin make us start over with God or is God's grace really sufficient and big enough to cover everything? And hey, if you've missed any of these sermons, I would highly encourage and suggest for you to check out our YouTube channel so you can revisit those. And even if you heard them, to revisit them again. Pastor Janelle and our friend Andrea have done an amazing job in unpacking some of these these pieces. Amen? And today, I want to focus on a catchphrase that I think every single one of us have either used or heard before. And we're going to just jump straight in. Is everybody ready? You, You buckled up? Ready for a wild ride? Okay. The myth that we want to unpack today, it's our fourth myth, is this. God wants to use us. Cricket, cricket, cricket. How many of you, by a show of hands, have ever used that phrase or heard that phrase before said to you? Anybody? Everybody? Okay. And now here, before we jump into this, I want to say this. For many of us in this room, this phrase is connected to some really powerful moments that have taken place in our relationship with God. And I don't want to diminish the outworking of what God has done in our lives with him. I also want to say that that phrase is connected to a number of different moments for people in this room that they thought God was going to use them for certain things. They thought God was calling them to a certain purpose, but it never happened. And I want to validate that and say those are real things as well. And I want to say this, the prayer of God use me as noble and as pure hearted as it might be, it misconstrues the very story of the, God, of the God that we worship from the scriptures. From Genesis, we see God created people to be with him. God created humanity and he walked in the cool of the garden and he wanted to be with people. He blesses and mandates the people of God to rule and reign with him on the earth. He actually has the whole story about us being with God. And it's not only in Genesis, but it's, out, it's all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. And honestly, when you look to the scriptures, you don't see invitations for God to use people, but for people to be with God as he does extravagant kingdom supernatural things on earth as it is in heaven. We actually see that the call is to be with God and to be a part of God's mission. We're not given an individual mission, we're given a co-mission. We are called to be with God, to reign with God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Sky Jitani says it this way. Remember, God's original intent for us was a mission. He called humanity to rule over the earth, to fill and subdue it, and to extend his creative order and beauty beyond the confines of the Garden of Eden. This work was to be accomplished in perpetual communion with God. And it was to be motivated not by a fear of insignificance, but by the assurance of God's love for us. 
You know, it's interesting that as we look to God's story, we see this reality of God calling his people to commune with him, to be with him, not to be used by him, is actually fully seen in the culmination of all of history in Christ Jesus. You see, at creation, everything was good. We were made for perfect relationship with God. But you know, as the story goes, that we broke that communion with God through sin. And we could not put it back together again. But the good news is that Christ Jesus, God in flesh, overcame our brokenness and our sin and the power of sin and hell and death and the grave. And he made a way for us to live with God forever. That's good news, beloved. And I need your amens today. (laughs) That's the good news of Jesus, that he gave us the gift of being with God perpetually, eternally, in relationship with God now and forevermore. Now, this relationship, beloved, isn't about how much we do for God. It's not about how much we're accomplishing for the kingdom. It's about how much we are with God, how much we are with the one who wants to be with us. In fact, when we look to the end of the book, in Revelation, it says this, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. The goal from the beginning of the story of God to the end of the story of God is not for the people of God to be used by God, but to be with him, to be with God. It's for all of God's creation to find its rightful place with him. Now, hear me out. This isn't a rejection of our call to surrender. We are absolutely called to surrender. We are absolutely called to submit ourselves to the Lord, but there is a vastly different understanding when it's about force and control and overpowering versus a God of love who wants us to be with him. And this is what we are called to be in, in this everlasting communion with God. When we say yes to Jesus, we are not given an everlasting to-do list. We are given an everlasting communion. God does not want to use you. He wants to be with you, beloved. That's good news, right? The trouble, though, is that many of us believe God wants to use us or we get to use God and we're missing the invitation to be with God and do things with God. And when we believe this myth, this lie that God wants to use us, we believe that God needs us, which he doesn't. We might believe that we have to do things for God or else he'll be disappointed in us, which is not true. We believe that if God doesn't use us or... If we don't do the right things, we'll never be blessed or have a reward in the kingdom of heaven, which is not true. When we believe this lie that God wants to use us, we actually distance ourselves from a loving father and we say that we don't want to do anything other than appease God and do all of these things to please him when through the work of Jesus, he's already pleased, beloved. That's the truth of the gospel, and that's the goodness of God's grace. When we believe that God wants to use us, we live in a fear of insignificance rather than in loving communion with the God who wants to be with us. John 15, Jesus says it this way, remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my word remains in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples." The call of Jesus to his disciples is to abide with him as he abides with us, to remain with God, to be with God as he is with us. I think for a lot of people in the church, they believe that God wants to use them because they believe the sole purpose of their existence is for the glory of God. But I think that a lot of us believe that the glory of God is only through our accomplishments. Can I tell you to reframe this morning your understanding of what God's highest glory looks like? God's highest glory is you being with him. You being loved by the king of kings and reciprocating that love back to God and to the people around you and to yourself. Because ultimately what Jesus depicts here is that his disciples are those that are connected to him. 
And the only way that you can produce anything in your life is by abiding in Jesus. It's by being connected to the vine. And here's the reality. God doesn't need you to produce anything. God is not some Greek mythological being or Greek God who needs your worship or needs your fear. Our God is eternal and limitless and incomprehensible and he doesn't need us, but he wants us. He doesn't need us at all, but he invites us into loving, perpetual, everlasting communion that's not based on our striving, it's based on what he accomplished. And it welcomes us to abide in him. This leads us to still a place of surrender and obedience, but it's not out of a place of trying to earn. It's out of a place that's recognizing God really wants the best for me. So if he called me to do it, I should do it because it's gonna be the best thing for me and the people around me. It leads us to a place where we're not trying to do things for God and we're so distanced from a loving father that we just think we have this, this, this person that's saying, you have to do this in order to appease me. We are called into a place not of striving, but of abiding, of being with the one who wants to be with us. And I will say this, when we remain in Jesus, we will do greater things than what we could ever do in our own self, in our own strength, amen? Amen. So I want to give you our main idea this morning, which is this, our myth buster for the day. Prioritize being with God over being used by God. Prioritize being with God over being used by God. And I want to look to the scriptures this morning to anchor us in this main idea and this myth busting idea. And we're going to be in John 5. So if you have your Bibles, why don't you open to John 5. And what I want to do this morning as we look through this story is I want to unpack some lifestyles, some certain types of approaches toward God in which people might believe that they are called to be used by God or to use God for their own benefit. And I know this this morning. God is with us, amen? Amen. And God is moving in this room and God has the greatest freedom and the greatest partnership that he's offering for every single one of us. No matter where we're at in our walk with Jesus, the, the, the invitation is equal and we get to walk into that freedom and partnership and commission of being with God this morning. Is anybody ready for that? Amen, four of you are, awesome. Hey, if you're open to John chapter five, why don't we stand to our feet if we are able and we're gonna read from God's word, verses one through nine. This is what the word of the Lord says. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate, a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. From time to time, an angel of the Lord would come down and stir up the waters. The first one into the pool after such disturbance would be cured of whatever disease they had. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured, he picked up his mat and he walked. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the invitation from your word that we get to be with you because of what you have done. And so we respond this morning, God, and just ask for you not only to inform us, but transform us by your word today. That you would move in our lives and help us to reorient ourselves, not to see you as some type of distant God that wants to use us, but as a loving Father and Son and Holy Spirit that's calling us into everlasting communion with you. So have your way, God. We lift up this time. We give you this space. We don't want a sermon. We want the movement of the presence and the power of God in this place. So would you heal and anoint and free and deliver and lead us into a greater connection with you and those around us and ourselves today. Lord Jesus, we love you. We bless you. We fix our eyes upon you. Your kingdom come, God. Your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Hey, why don't you take a seat and as you do, give a high five to a couple neighbors around you. Tell them that you're glad they're here. (laughs) Hey, by a show of hands, how many of you have ever listened to a song or read a book that when you heard a lyric or you read a line from a book, you just said in your heart and your mind, you're like, oh, that's what I've always thought, but I've never been able to write it down. Anybody experienced that before by a show of hands? There... 
There's just those moments where a concept or belief, you hear it through a song or you read it in a book, it just pops out to you. And I recently was reading a book by Sky Jatani, who I quoted earlier, called With. And he details uh, these different understandings about what it looks like to live a life with God and how to reimagine, reorient our perspective of what our lives with God can look like. But in the book, he details four different lifestyles in which people ultimately want to believe that God wants to use them or how they want to use God in order to maybe get something from God, or they want to be used by God to appease God, or be closer to God, or fulfill some purpose that God needs them to do. And I want to look at those four lifestyles with you as a way for us to better prioritize being with God rather than being used by God. Are you ready to do that today? So these four lifestyles are, we'll bring them up on the screen here, life from God, life under God, life for God, and life over God. Life from God is this category of people really believing that they just want God's blessings and gifts, but they don't really want God at all. They just want things from God. The second one is life under God. This is a posture of seeing uh, this cause and effect that if we do the things that God has called us to do, we will be blessed and rewarded. And our, not just us, but our families and our nation. And our job, therefore, is to determine what God wants and what God doesn't want. And then we keep that standard for ourselves and we make sure everybody else follows it as well. Does, it, does that sound familiar to anybody? The third one is life for God. It believes that the most significant thing that we can ever do is accomplish every great thing for the Lord in his name and for his service. This is life for God. And the last one is life over God. This says that the mystery of life and the world and all of God's goodness is thrown out the window because we already have the programs and principles and everything set in place for us to have controllable outcomes in our lives. We have life from God, under God, for God, and over God. Does that sound familiar to anybody in the room? I think in each of these lifestyles that we see this understanding that we are being used by God or we are using God or living in such a way that that we don't really need God because we already have all the answers and programs and principles. And if we can produce it by ourselves, then, then the distant God will be happy with us if we do all of that. And actually, when we look to the story that we just read in John 5, and we're going to continue to to read this morning, we actually see all four of these lifestyles depicted in this story. But we also see the truth of how Jesus is calling us not to be used by God, but to be with God. And I believe as we unpack this story, we will see a way to bust that myth and better prioritize living lives, not from or for or under or over, but with God. Is everybody ready for that today? Y'all with me still? Okay. So what we just read was a story about Jesus entering Jerusalem through the Sheep Gate. And he's going to a pool that's called Bethesda. This Aramaic word means the house of uh, mercy or the house of grace. And it's surrounded by five colonnades, which is actually the biblical number for grace. It is truly a place of God's grace. But this pool is also famous for being surrounded by a number of people who had disabilities, who were blind, couldn't walk, were paralyzed, and a number of other ailments as well. And there was a legend, a myth, that an angel would appear and would come and stir the waters, and the first one into the water would be healed there. Now, we just read that there was somebody who was called an invalid, which really means that he had a very, very severe illness. And he'd been there for 38 years. 38 years. And this is showing that he had become a beggar and was laying by the pool. And Jesus encounters this man. And the first thing he asks him is, do you want to be made well? And all of us went, "Uh, duh, Jesus. (laughs) He's been there for 38 years. But I think when we look deeper at what Jesus is is asking, he's actually confronting the myths of what this guy and the people around him were believing and welcoming them into a life with God. You see, he was speaking to the myth that these people didn't need God for their healing. These people are gathered at a space where there's this story that if the angel of the Lord appears and stirs the water, then the first one in will be healed. Do you know who's not there? The Lord. They just want the blessing and the gift and the spiritual experience. And scholars would actually say that at this pool, like many other pools, there were certain cults of Greek gods and mythological beings that people would gather and seek healing. Do you know who's not there? The Lord. 
People were pursuing a life from God approach. They wanted all the blessings, all the rewards, all the gifts, but they didn't want it through God. They wanted it through these experiences and they're pursuing it through myths and through these spiritual occurrences. But what Jesus comes forward and confronts and actually welcomes and invites this man and the other people out of is this life from God approach. And he says, do you want to be made well? Of course, Jesus, this guy wants to be made well. But what he's really asking is this, do you want spiritual experiences and blessings and gifts or do you want to be a consumer or do you want life with God? Do you want just these things or do you want life with God? Here's the thing, beloved, the myth of being used by God or using God, it still continues in the church today. And the words of Jesus still ring true today. Do you want to be made well? Do you want to be healed? Do you want just spiritual experiences and blessings and gifts? Do you want all the benefits or do you want life with God? Do you want, cons- do you want to be a consumer or do you want communion is what Jesus is asking. So I want to give you our first point of how we can prioritize being with God over being used by God. It's this, choose communion over consumerism. Choose communion over consumerism. Our myth of being used by God or using God is one that leads to a consumeristic lifestyle. It's all about what we're getting from God and it's actually not about being with God at all. It's just about spiritual experiences and getting whatever we can, even if it means that we mix in a bunch of the isms of this world in order to get the blessings that we want. It says, yeah, I love Jesus, but my astrological signs are really important too. I'm gonna go there. It says, yeah, I love Jesus, but I'm just gonna mix in a few of these other things because they give me blessings as well. The call and the invitation of Jesus is one in which we receive life from God, but it's ultimately not found outside of our connection with him. It's found in being with God. And Jesus reorients our perspective to find life, not in the the blessing of material things or the happiness and wealth of this world, but in one benefit, which is coming to God's table and being in everlasting communion with him. It says your title and your status and your bank account and your history and your pain and all of these things do not hinder you from the perpetual gift of being with God because his body and blood are just that good, beloved. That's the gift that we have been given. The invitation for us to choose communion is how we can prioritize being with God. In fact, our communion with God is the only thing that you will find in this world and forevermore that will meet all of the appetites of your heart and of your mind and of your soul. All of the things that are within us that say, I need this, or I want this, or I must have this. It is all completely fulfilled in the moment that we come into everlasting communion with God. All of it is met in that place. St. Teresa of Lisieux says it this way, receive communion often, very often. There you have the sole remedy if you want to be cured. Jesus has not put this attraction in your heart for nothing. What she's saying is this, that she has learned this single principle that in her reception of communion and being in perpetual relationship with God, it has met every other appetite in her heart and her flesh and her life. And it's the same for us, amen? So I wanna give you an action step, which is this. Receive communion daily. Receive communion daily. And we've talked about this in the past here at CCF, but I think it's of the utmost importance for us to repeat this as an action step. Receiving communion daily. Start your morning by receiving communion and, and focusing your heart and your attention on the gifts that God has given us. End your day in communion with the Lord. Thank God before you eat meals for his body given and his blood shed, bringing our full attention to the Lord. Because when we do so, we will recognize the appetites of our lives, the desires of our lives, the things that we are hungering and thirsting for are actually fully fulfilled in the meal that Jesus gives us. And it's only met in the place of perpetual communion with God. And that's the only foundation in which we will live off of that will lead us away from a consumeristic lifestyle towards a communion-based lifestyle of being with God. Amen? Y'all still with me? Amen. Let's jump back into John 5. We'll see another way we can prioritize being with God. Verse nine says this, at once the man was cured, he picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jewish leader said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. 
But he replied, the man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was. For Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him, the man, at the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had made him well. So this man encounters Jesus at the pool of Bethesda. He's radically healed as Jesus tells him to pick up his mat and walk. He's been ill for 38 years. A healing has happened in this moment. There was a miracle and the power and the presence of God met this man who had been waiting for a healing for 38 years and it happened, beloved. It happened. Can we just pause on that and say, praise God for that miracle. (laughs) Yet in all of this story, we see this happen on the Sabbath day. And leave it up to the religious, the Jewish leaders. They found this man who's carrying his mat on the Sabbath. And they say, why are you carrying your mat? Why are you carrying your mat? And he says, well, this one guy who just healed me told me to do it. It wasn't me. It was him, right? But he didn't even know who Jesus was. And later he finds Jesus in the temple and Jesus finds him. And Jesus is very straightforward. Listen, you have been made well and there is a wholeness that I want to give you to your body and your soul and your spirit. And he calls him out of sin and into the fullness of life itself because that's who our God is, amen? But here's the interesting point. Did you notice in this story that the Jewish leaders didn't even notice this man was healed? They never commented on it. What did they comment on? Why are you carrying your mat? Not, how are you carrying your mat? When did you start to get this strength after 38 years to carry your mat? No, they wanted to enforce the rules that they had brought forward in a legalistic perspective of life under God. This is the life under God type of lifestyle that we talked about earlier. It's a legalistic obedience of God's commands because if we obey, God will bless us. But if we disobey, God will smite and curse. And our calling is to determine what God wants to approve and what God disapproves. And we will hold ourselves and others to that that same legalistic, perfectionistic standard. This was the religious system that the Jewish leaders had created. And it was revealed in this moment that they valued the observance of the law more than the healing of this man. They valued it more in that moment. They said, this man might be healed. This man might not be healed, but he's breaking the Sabbath and we need to confront him for it. And this is the way in which when we ultimately say God wants to use me, it turns this into a legalistic, perfectionistic performance. It's about us glorifying God, but only through what we do and only through how we keep ourselves and others up to extreme perfectionistic standards. It's about us viewing ourselves and others rather through grace and love and mercy through judgment and criticism. It says in our hearts of hearts that we believe our life under God is a good thing because God is using me in such a way that I get to correct everybody else for the sin that they are in. Ouch, right? I get to correct them for their sin and their voting history. And if they say one thing that I've heard on a news channel, then I'm just going to throw the baby out with the bathwater and they're not welcome around here, here, here anymore. And guess what? God is using me, is what the belief looks like. That is life under God. And this ultimately says that God is only glorified through my striving. And when I strive, when I work, when I accomplish, when I have accolades, he will bless me. He will bless my family. He will bless my nation. And if, and if nobody else is with me, then they're all going to be in judgment. <laughs> Thanks for that laugh, Shelby. <laughs> The truth is that Jesus offers healing and salvation to all people though, beloved. And the gift of his grace is really, really beautiful. And it says this, don't emphasize humans' work, emphasize God's. Don't emphasize humans' work, emphasize God's because this is the precious remedy for our human condition. It empowers us to abide with God rather than strive for God. He never calls us to be legalistic judges. He calls us to be beloved children. And this is our calling to sit in the greatest truth that God's grace is really big enough to cover it all. So I want to give you a second way that we can prioritize being with God. And it's this, communicate life instead of death. Communicate life instead of death. You see, the life under God approach says that I only receive life when I tell others that they will be judged. When they will die. 
And ultimately, that starts with us criticizing ourselves and condemning ourselves and anybody else that doesn't align with our perspective and personal interpretation of what God approves or disapproves. Interestingly, though, this is what got humanity into trouble in Genesis 3. When humanity took of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they said to God, we know better than you do. And when we eat of the the fruit of life under God, we continue to say, I know better than everybody else. And I know better than God. But interestingly, God is the definer of these things, beloved. And Jesus actually shows us a vastly different way. In John 8, he is confronted by the religious leaders who find a woman who is caught in adultery. And that's the famous passage where he says, those who are without sin cast the first stone. Everybody leaves and he's left on the ground with this woman. He looks at her and says, I don't condemn you, but go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. He both confronts the weightiness and the power and the depth of what sin does in our lives, but this isn't a confrontation that says you are going to die. It is a place of saying life is available. Are you all with me today? Because God invites each and every one of us, not into a new religious system, but into a relational, life-giving, with God relationship now and forevermore. Christine Kane wrote it this way, we were never created to settle for mere religion. Jesus did not die so that we could have a religious belief system, but rather a life-giving relationship with our Father, amen? A life-giving relationship is one that not only gives life, but it overflows with life through us. So we've got to ask ourselves, what things am I saying to myself and the people around us? What, What things are we communicating with those who are around me? Now, please hear me on this. There is a massive theme in all of the New Testament, which is to put to death our self, to put to death the old self. But can I tell you what? All it is highlighting is this. There is a weight and a gravity to the the depth of sin and death in our lives, but it shows this, that God's grace and love is greater. And what it says is there is a new way to walk. Even the communication about death in the New Testament is for the outcome of life. Here's something that we can check within ourselves. Is my communication about death leading to life or leading to more death? Is it leading to unity or division? Is it leading to hope or hopelessness? The outcome that we ought to have is to say the things that God says because that will lead to life, amen? So I wanna give you an action step. Speak what God speaks. Speak what God speaks, It's so easy to fill our hearts and our lips with the things that we want to say about a person or a circumstance or even ourselves. It's so easy to, out of the overflow of our heart, let our mouth speak, maybe from a place of condemnation or criticism or hopelessness or pain. But our call is not to speak death, but to speak life, beloved. To speak life, because the power of life and death is in our tongue, right? And in this, God is inviting us to be with him. He is inviting us to recognize that he is with us in those hardships, in those moments where we want to speak from our flesh and from what we think is best. But what if we just paused for a second and say, God, what do you think about this? What do you think about me? How do you see that other person? What is your thought on this situation or this circumstance? Here's why this matters, because God is the best at calling things that were dead alive. And he's the best at looking at impossible situations and saying, there is hope. He's the best at looking at a pile of dirt and saying, there is gold in the midst of it. He's actually really good at looking at the pile of dirt that we were and breathing his spirit into it and saying, there is a human being there. This is how we can move forward away from this idea of God using us for legalism and perfectionism and calling us back to this place of being with God as we communicate life rather than death and speak the things that God is speaking rather than speaking the things that we want to or think we need to. Because here's the reality. When we speak what God speaks, it will have eternal impact. Amen? Amen. Everybody still with me? Let's jump back into John 5 and we'll look at a few more things here. Verse 16 says this, so because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. In his defense, Jesus said to them, my father is always at his work to this very day and I too am working. For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. 
So Jesus is confronted by the religious leaders finally, right? They have this moment where this man is healed. He doesn't know who it was. He finally finds out it's Jesus. He tells the religious leaders. And now the religious leaders, the Jewish leaders, go to Jesus and they begin to persecute him. They even create a plan to kill him because what they believed was that he had broken the Sabbath and he was even calling himself equal with God. So after seeing this man healed, they're still lost in such a legalistic, perfectionistic, performance-driven perspective that they want to go to the extreme of protecting and defending God, even if it means killing the one who people believe is the Messiah. They think that what they need to do is accomplish great things for God, no matter the cost, no matter if it means another person's life, no matter what it looks like, if we can appear and put this out to everybody, and if we could do these great things, imagine what people will say about the accomplishments we've made and the accolades we have and the trophies that are connected to our name. Imagine how God will see us and how other people will see us. This beloved is a missing of the mark and it's a calling away from life with God. But it's interesting that when Jesus responds to this religious leaders, he says, listen, my father's always working, so I'm at work too. He's not saying to them, I'm breaking the Sabbath. What he's saying is this, I'm living as the beloved son of God. You see it as legalism, I see it as communion. You see it as perfectionism and and performance, I see it as abiding. Was Jesus working? Absolutely. But according to their legalistic definition, he broke the Sabbath. According to the kingdom of God, he was living life with God. Amen? This is a drastic call away from the life for God. I need to do all these things for God and a drastic call into a life with God. So I want to give you our third point this morning, how we can prioritize being with God. Commit to abiding over striving. Commit to abiding over striving. Our commitment to abiding over striving is another way that we can prioritize and say, I want to be with God rather than be used by God. It's a way in which we can look to Jesus' response from this passage and recognize he is still working and doing things and moving and operating, but it wasn't about how much he was doing. It was, it was about who he was doing it with. Are you with me? It wasn't about how much he had accomplished. It was about what he had accomplished and who was with him in the midst of it. Did you know that Jesus always prioritized his relationship with his father? We're told in Luke, often Jesus withdrew to pray. Many times the disciples, when they're overwhelmed and they don't know what to do, guess where they find Jesus? In solitude and prayer. Many times Jesus invites his followers to remain with him as he remains with them. He calls them into a place of intimacy, beloved. In fact, this is what he prays in John 17. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you love me before the creation of the world. Do you see what he prays for his disciples? Not that they would do wonderful things for God, but they would be with him where he's at. And that's the glory that's been given to Jesus, that his disciples would be with him where he is at. The lifestyle of trying to do and accomplish and be used by God is one that ultimately says, I want to value products more than people. It looks at platforms and says, that's way more, impre- way more important than presence. It looks at performance and proficiency and says, yeah, purity of heart means nothing as long as you can perform and be proficient in something. It leads to a constant striving so that we can please God and do great things and have acceptance and accolade and all of these wonderful things according to the world. But Jesus shows us in this account that being with God vastly outweighs any notion of doing great things for God. Vastly outweighs it, beloved. He reveals throughout his ministry and throughout his life that the goal of his disciples is to be with God as they are and as they do and as they go. The things that are most celebrated by Jesus and his kingdom are actually actions like serving and giving and loving and praying, but doing them in the secret but doing them in this place of being with God. The call was never to be used by God, but to live with God and to love with God as he loves the people around us, amen? Daryl Johnson writes it this way, I am to love you not as much as God loves you, but with God as he loves you. That is, I am to see God loving you and join him in his loving you. I am a co-lover with God and a co-lover of one another. 
Here's our calling and our invitation this morning, beloved. As Christians, we are supposed to do things. We are, that we've been commanded and exhorted and encouraged to, but we are not called to have the foundation of doing them for God, and then if we don't, he's gonna be angry with us. We are called to have the foundation, not of an individual mission, but a co-mission of being with God as he is active in our world and participate in the mission of loving him and loving others and making disciples. Our calling is to be with God because when we're with God, the wonderful work of the kingdom is just an overflow of our relationship. Amen? So I want to give you this action step. Do what God is doing. Do what God is doing. One simple way that we can commit to abiding is by doing what God is doing and keeping our eyes fixed on what the Lord is calling us into. This is an anchoring of our identity outside of our work and inside of our connection, our communion with God. In Mark 4, there's this really beautiful story of Jesus telling his disciples, let's go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. We'll go to the other side, is what he says. They all get on a boat. Jesus is asleep on the back. Wind and waves start hitting it. The disciples are running around frantic. They wake up Jesus, say, don't you care that we're perishing? So he wakes up and commands the wind and waves to stop. And the text tells us the the sea comes to a complete calm. They go, wow, even the wind and waves obey him. And he looks at them and says, you of little faith. Why? Why? Because they didn't believe what he had promised them. We will go to the other side. In the midst of the storms, they're frantic about, can we save our own lives? Don't you care that we're dying? Jesus, what are you doing? Now we've got to step up and do all of these things. But rather, what if they per- viewed, it for this, uh, viewed it through this perspective? If God promised that we'll make it to the other side, I'm just going to be with them in the, in the midst of the storm. And if he's taking a nap, I'm going to take a nap. Right? Because if I'm just with him, I'm doing what he's doing. Regardless of what the other disciples are saying or regardless of what storm or wind and waves are crashing in to the boat, if Jesus is doing it, we ought to be doing it because that's what life with God looks like. It's not a performance. It's not a, a perfectionism. It is a call to abide and do what God is doing. Amen? Can I give you one last point this morning? Everybody still awake? Okay. I trust you. <laughs> Interestingly, the story continues and Jesus interacts with the religious leaders and he's telling them that if his father is doing it, he's going to be doing it. And both the father and the son have the ability to give life because they have life in themselves. They are both able to judge perfectly and rightly because they are releasing a mutual testimony, the father and the son in unity that says this, Jesus is God and Jesus is the Messiah. That's what he's telling the religious leaders. And he offers this really interesting correction to them, but also an invitation to them as well. In John 5, 39 through 40, it says this. Jesus speaks this to the Jewish leaders. You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very, these are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. If Jesus were to step foot into the church today, he would say this, you've gone to a lot of Bible studies, but you've missed me. You have a lot of knowledge about Ecclesiastes, but you don't know the one who fulfills Ecclesiastes. That's what he's saying to these religious leaders, these Jewish leaders. He's saying, listen, you have not only missed the healing of the man at the pool of Bethesda, you've not only thought that you can find life in the scriptures, but you've missed the one that the scriptures proclaim about. I'm standing right in front of you, Jesus says. I am the Messiah. I am God in flesh. I am here to give you life. And what he's challenging for them is a life over God perspective. They thought they had it all figured out. They had all the programs. They had all the principles. They had all these things dialed in. They can control everything that would happen in their lives. And he states this, you've done well in studying the scriptures, but you have missed what the scriptures lead you to, which is life in me and life with me. They have mistaken the goal of studying the scriptures and they have missed it for the, they have missed the presence of God for the principles and programs of this world. And guess what? In, for many in the church today, the concept of being used by God or even using God is one in which we look to a life over God. We think, hey, I'm just going to use God and prioritize systems and things that have worked in the past and formulas and principles and programs. Who needs the presence of God? I could do it all in my own flesh and my own striving. This guy did it before me. This gal did it before me. I can just implement this and everything will turn out the way that I say it will turn out. 
It is in this that we think we can be used by God or really just simply we're gonna use God for whatever benefit we want. And this is the model in which numbers and outcomes are more important for people than being with God. It says that it's all about declaring this is what God wants or doesn't want and if you're not in step with it, then you're missing the principles and we don't even need his presence to convince you of it. And let me be clear, we should search the scriptures every day. We should examine and search them. But if we don't do it for love, we're just bobbleheads, beloved. We're just bobbleheads. We should do the things that are helpful in the kingdom of God. And if that involves principles and programs, wonderful. But if it's without love, we're just a clanging symbol. We should absolutely be concerned for numbers because numbers represent people. And we should absolutely be concerned for outcomes because outcomes look like the kingdom of heaven moving forward. We should absolutely be interested in the principles from the scriptures, but without love, we are missing what Christ invites us into, which is life with him. Our goal is not to be used by God or by exchanging relationship with God for something that we think he needs. It's to simply reorient ourselves and come back to allow his presence to be more important than anything else in our lives. So I want to give you one last point this morning. Cherish the presence more than the programs. Cherish the presence more than the programs. More than programs, more than principles, we will find that when we prioritize being with God rather than being used for God, we will step into a place of valuing the things that God values. Of moving forward into the place of seeing people as more than just a product of seeing more than just a platform and valuing God's presence more than anything else that we can do in our lives. We won't make statements that stand over God or try to control outcomes or say, you have to do this principle or have to do this posture. We can just simply stand before God and say, God, you are God and I am not. And I am in desperate need of you and I don't know what to do, but I desperately need your presence just like Adam needed your presence when he was a pile of dirt. (laughs) Just like the bones in Ezekiel 37 needed the breath of God to come back together, I desperately need your presence, Lord, more than anything else in my life. The church at this time in history does not need more good principles or good programs. We need the presence of God. We need the presence of God and we need God's guidance and love to move us forward. A.W. Tozer said it this way, if the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, 95% of what we would do would go on and no one would know the difference. If the Holy Spirit had been withdrawn from the New Testament church, 95% of what they did would stop and everybody would know the difference. Why is this true? Because the early church didn't do anything other than going forward with God's presence. It was all built around the Holy Spirit guiding them and doing whatever God was calling them to do. And this doesn't happen by us being used by God. This happens by us being with God. It's a reorientation to say God's presence is the most important thing in my life. And it is better for me to sit at his feet than go around and striving and working. Mary was told, you have chosen the better thing and it will not be taken away from you. Our being with Jesus, our prioritizing our connection with him positions us in a manner where we're not looking to God to say, God, use me, but we're looking to him to say, I need your breath. And the only place I can find it is by being with you. I'm gonna welcome up Aaron at this time. And I wanna give you one last, one last action step. Everybody with me? Our last action step is this, return to your first love. Return to your first love. You know, it's interesting as we value God's presence more than programs and principles, we are called not to a legalistic returning to first love or not out of this place of getting more power or accolade or possession or insights about programs and principles. It's just simply returning to this place. God loved us first. And he revealed it in this. You didn't love first, but God did. And he revealed it by giving his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sin by laying down his life and being raised from the dead so that we would be called children of the most high God. The New Testament writers look to a number of churches, Ephesus, that are doing wonderful things. I know the good things that you do, John says. John says, Jesus says. But you have forgotten your first love is what he says. 
Return to your first love. Discover and rediscover that the Spirit of God has been inviting you into this place of a loving, everlasting, perpetual communion. And it's in this return that we find what really matters is not our accolades. It's not our status. It's not our title. It's not our striving. It's not our accomplishments. It's not any of these things of life under or over or for or from. It's life with God. Amen? I want you to stand to your feet this morning as we close up our time. Beloved, there is a reality that many of us have heard or believed this myth that God wants to use us or that we can use God. And the truth of God's story, the truth of the scriptures is this. God created all of humanity to be with us. God created us to be with us. He's not a distant God who wants to use us for some purpose or plan that we won't ever have communion with him about. He wants to be with us as we do wonderful kingdom, supernatural work here on earth as it is in heaven. It reorients our lives into this place and this posture and this position that says, I am deeply dependent upon the presence of God and his breath in my lungs and in my life. And I'm not in it for the blessings. I'm not in it to find the next principle or program. I'm simply in it because this is what I was created for. And this is the only thing that'll meet every hunger and desire in my heart. And I know it will do the same for the person next to me. I long to live in a life with God. And so this morning, Aaron's going to lead us in a time of worship about singing that there's nothing else more important than simply being with Jesus. And I want to invite you this morning, this altar up here at the front of the stage, it is open. And if you have been feeling the Spirit of God convicting and placing something on your heart and you want to do some work with the Lord this morning, please come forward and let the Lord sift through and sort things out in your heart. Let the Lord search you and test you and see if there's any anxious things thought in you or wicked way in you and lead you into the life everlasting because that life is only with him. The good news this morning, beloved, is that God is not interested in your accomplishments or, or feats of strength or striving. He is interested in you. He doesn't simply want a spiritual life. He wants all of your life and he laid down his life so that you could find life in him. So this morning as we respond, beloved, I want to encourage you, open yourself. Let the Lord search you. Let the Lord lead you into a greater connection with him by laying down this idea that God needs to use me to this idea of God wants to be with me. God is in this room and he's ready and he's willing and he's able. He wants to meet with you this morning. Amen. So Father, we thank you for the truth of who you are. We thank you, God, that you are with us and that you are for us, that you're moving in our midst. And we ask this morning, King Jesus, that you would help us reorient and reframe our lives with the truth that you want to be with us. God, I lay down my idol that says you need to use me and I pick up the truth this morning that says you want to be with me. Would you meet the people of God in this space? Would you meet the people of God watching online? Would you meet the people of God that are going to hear of your word and taste of your goodness and feel of your presence? Would you meet us with a delivering, freeing, hope-filled encounter this morning, Lord, that would move us forward into a place of living life with you, God? We relinquish any other lifestyle. We don't want to live over or under or for or from. We want to live with you this morning. So move in the hearts of the people of God today in Jesus' name.